I'll talk about. Okay, hey, broadcast this- is live. My wife is walking there. <laughs> She's a, my wife's live. Hey, <laughs> okay. You know, I, I I love all the coaches' wives. I mean, y- y'all, you and Coach McNally are married to saints. I've never met his wife, but I know that they are saintly. Uh, yeah. This is Troy Taylor with the Championship Football Coaches Clinic podcast. I'm so excited to have Coach Strollo. And I've known Coach Strollo when he recruited Meadowbrook High School, but I did not know that he played for Coach McNally. And everybody knows that I've kind of hang, I'm hanging my hat on being the only guy in the world in America that could teach Coach McNally how to use Twitter. All right. And I told him, Coach, I said, anybody can coach Anthony Munoz. I was like, but teaching you to use Twitter. That's the best coaching job I've ever done. All right, so Coach Strollo. Uh, yeah, hey, I got Coach. I got sound effects. Yeah, there you go. For the people that don't know, Coach, introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about your journey as a player, as a coach, where you're from, Coach. Well, there, there there's not much uh, to talk about, but I am. I just turned 69 in January from New Jersey, played at a place, a Long Branch High School, was lucky enough to get a scholarship to Boston College, was there. Um, that's We had uh, Jim McNally as our um, coach my senior year. And uh, we, uh, you know, uh, Boston College, it was, uh, you know, pretty well known for offensive line. I was never a starter. I got to tell you right off the bat, I was a backup guy and we had, uh, we had two really good line. Co- well, we had three. Um, we had Ron Gunther, Gunther, who later on was the uh, AD at Illinois. Um, then we had Jim and uh, we had, uh, well, we had a bunch of uh, great coaches. I mean, we had a bunch of great coaches uh, and, um, Anyway, so I got into coaching. I had always wanted to be a football coach and got into coaching, went back to my hometown um, and tried to try to uh, get involved in high school football there. And I coached with a guy named Lou Versillo, uh, who's a Hall of Famer in New Jersey. And he uh, he couldn't get me hired at his school, but he got me hired at at another school, uh, a guy named Rich Mosca. uh, kind of took me under his wing and let me go. And uh, I got into um, I got into high school football for a while. I actually got to know um, some uh, some visionaries. Uh, one of them was Frank Glazier. Mm. Uh, Tell I me actually about him, grew- Coach, because I, I wasn't yeah. around when Coach Glacier was still around run, running the Glacier Clinics. But tell me a little bit about him, Coach, his story. Well, uh, I tell you, I, I met him. Uh, when he came to Long Branch High School, he had been hired uh, to replace m- our high school coach, who I thought was a very good football coach, but uh, had moved on to other things. And uh, Frank was a was a guy from New England, and he was uh, pretty well known, uh, well known enough to have college coaches come and pretty much begin the the Glazier clinic and the idea, the original idea of the clinic, from what I understand, I wasn't there at the time, but he would have these, these coaches come on the field and literally coach people. Yeah. He wasn't, he didn't have them lecture and he had them coaching. I'd like to do the same thing to tell you the truth. I, I, a friend of mine's doing something down there in Texas like that. I'd like to coach coaches. If I could, that'd be something I'd be interested in doing. But that's what he – I think his clinic started out like that. And he he brought the the, uh, the Houston V. He's, you know, he's a New, New England accent, and he brought that into our area. And other other guys were running, but he really knew how to run it. And, uh, you know, very successful. And I think the clinic thing just took off, and he, he basically got out of coaching and just ran the business. Um you know, I, I had a chance. As a matter of fact, I was going up to visit my wife. I had wrecked my truck and I had to take a bus. And he picked me up at the bus stop where he just happened to be going up for a clinic. 
and we <laughs> drove up together and I had already known him. I'd worked, done some work in the weight room with him and uh, we just drove up together. He and I and, and uh, one of his uh, assistants and we just talked the whole way and it really got me thinking about college coaching. And so I gave up my job and went as a GA to Springfield College, um, you know, Division II school. But it it had a guy named Howard Vandersee, who was a tremendous influence on my life. And Howard uh, Vandersee, uh, his brother had coached at Long Branch High School. Uh, Phil Vandersee played pro football. And so I kind of knew who he was. And another one of my buddies was up there coaching with him. So I went up there and got, got involved there, uh, got into a graduate program in education with the thought of always going back to high school. Never did. Uh, almost did a couple of times, but didn't. And then uh, managed to get to uh, Northeastern University. I was coaching on defense and uh, I was coaching the outside backers and uh, through my travels had a chance to meet a guy named John Gutekunst, who had been the head coach at Minnesota. He was at the time he was a young defensive coordinator at Virginia Tech, and he's been a tremendous influence on me. Matter of fact, uh, the uh, the scoot technique and, and the brace, well, the brace came from uh, from uh, Paul Alexander, the, the term brace, but John had taught us the rocker steps, which was basically stepping backwards to go forwards. And he, he had had uh, some great players at Virginia Tech, and he taught that stuff to me, and it was like magic. And I still, you know, this hand, the hand placement from the medicine balls basically came from John. If, you, if you're going to fight a, a cut block, you want to catch the man's helmet between your hands and then splash him on the ground. Well, in order to do that, you've got to have your hands low enough and you that position, that arm position, the hooks and the hand placement, that's where the medicine ball idea came from, okay? And the stepping backwards, John taught us that basically if you're in a two-point stance, in order to get your weight going forward, Okay, you got to get your weight in front of your feet. Well, it was easier to move your feet slightly backwards. And that's the big, that's where I I hear a lot of people talking about, well, you're stepping backwards. Yeah, we may, our feet may be going backwards, but our weight's never going to go backwards. We're going to induce what we call a teeter. We're going to, we're over our our feet, whether you're in a three-point or or two-point stance, Weights over your feet if you're playing offensive line. How do you get your weight in front of your feet? Well, it's a lot easier to move your feet backwards just slightly to get that weight rolling. And everything's about weight transfer. You get these guys practicing, you know, the old, you know, the old uh, George DeLeon step and freeze. Well, you can't do that with the drop steps. You know, we don't call them drop steps. We call them braces. You got to It's got to be dynamic. You can't stop. OK, you got to You got to get induce that teeter. And the way you want to think about teeter is it's a tree. OK, trees, trees going to stand there forever. You cut the you cut the truck. I don't know if you've ever done any uh, any tree work. I did. I almost cut my hand off. Like coach, I, I, I had a tree fall on my guy's log splitter, coach, and that was the last okay. day I ever helped him, coach. Well, yeah, stay away was- from them because they're dangerous. But uh, <laughs> when you when you cut. When you cut a wedge out of a tree, it, it it topples. Well, that it's being powered by gravity. Well, that's the same as a teeter. When you take that those feet and throw them backwards, you you've induced a teeter, and all of a sudden you're being powered by gravity. Now pick that gravity up with with extension or steps or whatever, and you're going fa- you're going forward pretty fast. And uh, anyway, this rocker step technique came from John. I don't know where he got it from. He might have invented it. But that, that's the genesis of, of most of the stuff I do. That hand placement and the, uh, and the rocker steps, what, what we, Paul Alexander later turned them as brace steps. And the way I'm going to get up and, and just, it's going to be hard to demo this stuff, but I'm Italian, okay? I'm from New Jersey. I'm Italian. And I'm, I'm very proud of 
Italy. And one of the things in Italy, if you if you go to Venezia, you're going to see the gondolas. You know what that is, right? That's it's the a boat. boat. And they move the boat with a stick. Okay, in order to make the boat go this way, they take the stick and push it that way. Yes, sir. Well, that's exactly what you're doing when you take drop steps. You're you're picking your stick up, your leg, and you're putting it slightly behind that boat and pushing into the mud, and that pushes the boat forward. And that was the that's the analogy. That's the first analogy I used uh, for those types of steps. And the whole idea, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was just to transfer your weight. Everything's about weight transfer. Everything's about getting your weight going or or not getting your weight going, controlling your weight, either or. Okay, if you're committed to going forward, you got to get your weight in front of your feet. Okay, if you want to stop, what we call accelerate, either go forward, either go or stop or change direction, your feet and the, the distribution of your weight is everything. Okay, so anyway, so we got, we I got into, uh, offensive line because I had gone away to a place called Washburn University and I had always been interested in the offensive line anyway. Uh, I played offensive line. I coached in high school. I coached at Springfield, but I I took this job as a defensive coach at Northeastern and uh, went out to a place called Washburn University, NAIA school, and taught these rocker steps and all this other stuff and had a lot of success with it. We were we were a pretty good outfit out there. We had 50 scholarships. I don't know where they got them. We had a training table. We had everything. No no rules, NAIA, you know. <laughs> yeah, I played in NAIA. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, Coach Ramsire. Man, we had some guys that should have been playing at Florida. Yeah, well, I mean we sent one to we sent one down to Kaiser and he should have been playing at NC State. He couldn't get in. The guy was he was a stud. He was three hundred. We don't know how big he was. He he went down there all American, and he had some problems and didn't work out for him. Probably why he wasn't at NC State. Hmm. But uh, you know we had some dudes. And I, anyway, so I got a chance to go right back to Boston to Northeastern University in Boston. Became the offensive line coach. Uh, we we went uh, to the wishbone. And I didn't know much about the wishbone other than defending it, but we studied against uh, with Jim Young and, and uh, Bob Noblet and uh, you know Fisher DeBerry and all those guys, and we were pretty good. We we led the nation in rushing one year, and uh, you know we we were pretty stout. And I was committed to it. And the 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 big thing back then was to get into your stance, a three or four point stance, and kick your feet back. And we had a guy at Boston College who played like a hundred years in the NFL. His name was Tom Condon. He's a pretty, pretty oh, wealthy yeah, guy him. right now. Well, Tom, when he'd get into his three-point stance, he'd 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 ground his hand and then he'd take both feet and kind of nudge them back. So he had mm-hmm. a lot of weight in the hand, wishbone stance. He was pretty good at knocking people around. And we had a guy named Don Masick who played like a hundred years in the NFL. He was a center, and I, I still to this day remember him snapping that ball, and both of those feet would go backwards. He would go, and you know, because a center, the, most of the stuff we talk about, you know, when you're when you're a guard or a tackle, you can line up off the ball a yard or two, not a yard or two, but some of those tackles are, are pretty deep. <laughs> but that center, he's he's he's. Depending on his flexibility, that's all the stretch he has. If he can get that ball out in front of him, he's got an advantage. But basically, a lot of these guys, that ball's right under their chin, and that nose guard is lined up in their helmet. So how do they generate force without any sort of distance? You know, momentum is – is is uh, the formula for momentum is uh, – Weight times acceleration? No, no, excuse me. It's it's mass times velocity, I believe it is. Whatever it is. Okay, yeah. Jim's always making fun of me. Yeah, but I'm not a rocket scientist, coach. I don't know any formula. Well, it's 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 simple stuff. If you're if your car, if you, you you've been to the drag races before? I've seen them before on TV. They got one in Dinwiddie, coach. Other okay. than that, I, I've never been to one, but I've seen them on TV. Well, when that t- car takes off, it's accelerating. And once it's accelerated to top speed, 
that's called momentum. Mm -hmm. Well, the center doesn't have much chance to build up any momentum. Okay, so how does he make force without momentum? Okay, well, there's a number of different ways. Uh, but one of the ways we studied was the rocker step. How do we, we're going to get our weight going forward. We're going to use gravity to, to, for the tree effect, the teeter. And then we're going to engage our legs and arms or whatever else we're doing to, to create force. The other thing is if you can't overcome force, add force. Now, some people say, well, we're redirecting force. No, you're not redirecting force. You're adding force at an angle, okay? It's angular momentum. Angular momentum, okay, is hit. You get two cars hit each other like that. It's like hitting a brick wall. Two cars going 50 miles an hour is like hitting a brick wall at 50 miles an hour, okay? But if you hit that car, if you got a nice Cadillac and you hit an F-150 in the door, you're going to knock that F-150 off course, maybe flip it. Well, that angular momentum, how do you get an angle on somebody who's right in front of you? Well, there's you, you create it. And the easiest way to create it is to add a torque, either a lateral torque or a vertical torque. We used to call it, when I first started doing this, We, we I'm jumping around here, but when we went to the University of Massachusetts, as, as I went as the offensive line coach, one day I took every kid I had and I divided them into two groups. It was about 20 guys. I had tight ends. I had, I said, okay, you're over here. You're over here. Here's a line of scrimmage. Here's the, here's what we're going to do today. This is the drill. This crew over here, you're going to go and you're going to block them. They're going to block you. The only difference is this crew starts it and this crew reacts to it. And then when you've gone over here, as soon as you've taken a rep over here, you go over there. And we videoed it. And we saw who was able to drive the other guy backwards. And there was no, there was no vertical, nothing. I mean, they were like got right on top of each other. It was just a line that we had painted, you know, a grid line. And we started to study it. And the, the two things that stood out were this. Whoever got the best hand placement, and whoever got their feet brought their feet forward somehow after contact, not before contact, after contact, they were the guys that won. So we started to, to dissect it, and we realized that we were creating an angular mo – I didn't call it this at the time. I called it lift, but an angular momentum through the man's chest and breastplate, getting him and moving him at an angle – just like hitting, just like hitting that that F-150 in the door. We were hitting him in the chest and flipping him up. And anybody that, that did it had to have hand placement. So anybody that flailed, okay, and here's the analogy. What do you call a boxer that boxes like this? An idiot. Knocked out, bro. Yeah, he's gone. He's knocked out. Okay, a boxer keeps his hands in front of him to protect himself and to take advantage of any openings. If he's out here, he's going to be late. If he's back here, which is where everybody was was back then. When, when yeah, we the holsters. Early 90s, early 90s, holsters. I yeah. was doing everybody was doing. We started to realize that this was better. And then we didn't know at the time, because I didn't understand leverage. But this, this is a lever. Here's, here's the fulcrum, okay? There's a there's a uh, a muscle attachment, okay, and it moves that lever. This is a lever. That angle in the elbow, if you lock that elbow, it just makes the arm shorter, okay. This will lift more weight than this. It just will. You take take yeah. ten pounds and hold it out. Take ten. Take here. Wait a minute. Hang on, Coach. You're the Archimedes. Of football coaches. I have Archimedes. Yes, I am. Archimedes. Archimedes. I don't even know how to say his name. I just know he invented the lever, the pulley, and the it screw. Was, it was a, the lever. He invented. He was a lever. Greek. Well, he didn't invent the lever. He discovered the lever. Okay. <laughs> okay. The concept of the lever. There's three types of levers. I can get into it, but we don't need to do that right now. <laughs> I got this ball. It weighs about 14 to 15 pounds. I hold it right here. It 
it's heavy. I hold it out here. It's a lot heavier. Did that ball change weight? No. I just changed the lever. The output lever got longer, and the input lever stayed the same. The input lever is where my muscle is attached to the bone. I can make the, the output lever shorter, the distance from, from contact to the, the fulcrum, shorter by bending my elbows. So we started playing with that. We didn't really know the science what behind year? it. What year is this? 1992. Wow. 1992. So, it, it, like yeah. you said, it was here. Then it was like boom, punch. Well, but then this here. is these are the thing. This is the things we we found out from that drill. Anybody that was late with their hands had a hard time winning. Anybody that got their hands in there real quick had an easy time winning. Okay. You do you, you lift weights? You've been lifting weights for a while, right? Yes, sir. all your life. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Guy can bench 400, he can probably squat 500. Okay, so obviously, legs are bigger, muscles are bigger. Okay, so what we realized was this was good if the load was light. I got a baseball, but I'm we're jumping around here a lot, but I get excited when I talk about this stuff. Yeah, I got a baseball bat. I can swing it pretty fast. I hit a little baseball. I knock it out of the box. Guy throws a shot put at me, breaks the bat. Okay? This, against certain things like DBs or somebody standing up, is pretty effective. Somebody holding a shield is pretty effective. Against a, a freaking bull that's coming at you 100 miles an hour, all this, all this does is – it doesn't do anything. It, you got to engage your, your legs. Well, if you don't grab something, you can't engage your legs. And if you're late, he's going to engage his hands into your chest. If your hands are late, it's the boxer that boxes like this. You get knocked out. So we didn't know it at the time, but we were actually protecting our own chest. And we were shortening up our output lever our arms and actually locking them up and getting our legs into it. And that's what we were doing. I mean, and it, it, by, it makes by, sense. By, by flipping, I used to call it lifting. And I had, a, a, Jim put me on, in on, um, he, we started, he and I started talking about this in, uh, I think it was around the year two, 99 or 2000. And he got me my first, uh, speaking engagement at the cool clinic and i talked about this at, well, i talked about lifting but recently after after a while i said that's crazy we're not lifting anything i got a refrigerator in here probably weighs 300 pounds i i'm probably strong enough well i don't know about now but i used to be strong enough to pick that son of a gun up but it was hard but if i wanted to move it okay if and if, if it was a if it was on rollers, it would push. But if it was on a rug or something like that, and I wanted to move it, I walked it. I walked it from mm -hmm. the corner. Tore, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? You've done that before. Yes, sir. Yeah, I've done that with yeah. weight machines, like in a weight room when I'm changing a weight, you know, weight room around. Okay. Well, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're rocking that. You're using that machine. It's force. As yeah. a lever. It is a, that machine's a lever. It's just okay. like a crowbar. I'm using that refrigerator like a crow. Well, I'm doing the same thing to a defensive lineman when I do that. He's a refrigerator, and I'm not I'm not trying to pick him up. I'm trying to flip him. Yeah, because I mean, when it's strength on strength, I mean, you're just going to have a stalemate. But when you, when, you right. when you bring the force a different direction, that's taking his force that way too. And it makes me think about like a boxer with a jab or a cross, like the uppercut, you can, I, I believe you can bring more force. Maybe because well, of the bicep. Well, I, I, you, the, the question, this is what I got to tell you. I can box somebody and bring a lot of force, but I, am I going to move him? He's a 300 pound dude. Okay. So let's, let's, that's a different thing. It's called the load. That's the load. Now hang on to that. Okay. What I'm saying is, if I'm just if I'm boxing somebody, I'm just trying to hurt them. I'm trying to put blows into them, right? Okay, and whatever that punch is, whatever I'm using, it's it basically depends on what he's protecting against. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for an opening. 
Okay. When I'm going against the guy, you was just what you said. There's going to be a stalemate. But if I add a force at an angle, okay, and use him as a lever, I'm going to move him. And here's something about the human body that people got to understand. We're two-legged animals, okay? When we engage with a, with a, another guy, we're four-legged animals. We've created four legs. We'll stay there all day until one of the animals adds a force. And you study your film, I'm just going to tell you, you're either adding a force upwards or at an angle with your arms. And you're going to get that guy off balance a little bit, and he is going to lose his ability to add force to you, and that's how you're going to move him, just like you're moving that refrigerator. That's what you're going to do. Now, the thing that we've, we learned early on was you can only add force at an angle if you have an angle, in other words, if I'm blocking down on somebody, I got an angle. I got to go get them. I can hit them with anything. I got the angle. But if I'm front, if I'm attached to him frontally and we're making, we've made a four-legged animal, the only way I can add force is with my arms. I can push with anything. I can push with my shoulder. I can push with my flipper. I can push with my head. I can push with my butt if I want to. Okay? I can pull but I, I need my arms. And the only way I can torque is with my arms. That's it. What we used was, was animal analogies. Okay, the bull. Okay, the bull can bang heads. He can hook you a little bit with his horns. Okay, the ram can only bang heads. Right, his horns go backwards. The bull's head, horns go forward. He can hook you with his horns. Okay, the snake can strike you. But he really can't do anything. The bear can do it all. The bear can headbutt you, shoulder butt you, butt butt you, punch you, lift you, do this, throw you, pick you up, tear you, throw you around. Why? Because he can use his paws. Mm, that cocaine bear. I saw the preview for cocaine bear. That kids are really I don't know nothing about cocaine. <laughs> Co cocaine bear is the hottest movie out, coach. It's about a but bear that eats all this cocaine and goes crazy and starts killing people. But well, it's a bear, Coach. You're going to want to see it because it, the, you I, said the bear would be the best offensive lineman. Boom. Well, that's that's what we said. That's what we said. And the bear can change his – the bear can do this. He can but pronate he his he, he Well, think about this. A tiger. A tiger can't do that. No. A bear can do it. Okay. Pronating and supinating allows us to do a lot of things – to our target we can get under it we can strike it this way we can push it away we can throw it up in the air we can throw it sideways we can do a number of things with that target because we can do this a gorilla versus a bear you still got the bear you tell me i don't know coach i'd like to if see the, that match up if the gorilla is, is a silverback I, I i might go with the gorilla but but don't forget the bear's got claws. Yeah, you're right. And you the, slash and the that gorilla a couple of times. Yeah, the gorilla doesn't. Yeah, the bear, bear. it depends on the kind of bear, too. When them little itsy-bitsy black bears, you know, 300-pounder, I go with the gorilla. You get one of them polar bears, Yeah, I go with the polar bear. Or the Kodak. Yeah. The Kodak. Kodiak, yeah. The Kodiak. Kodiak. Yeah. Well, anyway, so I don't know if you're following me. Yeah, I'm this, following you, Coach. This stuff is coming out. It's this is you're talking about 30 years of just yeah. This is this is what everybody wants to hear. This is what Coach McNally said okay. that he wanted to hear. Well, anyway, getting back to this here medicine ball, what we realized was I can make this ball part of my body. Okay, I believe we're the first ones to do it. I'm going to mention I gave the video to to a number of people. One of them was a guy named uh, Damian Rabuski, who's right down there with you guys at James Madison. And he used it right away because I had coached him at Lafayette about with this stuff. And he knew right away what to do with it. And then we just started playing with it and just, you know, got back. You know, he plays with it a little bit. I played with it a little bit. And it got to be a pretty handy little tool. And I, I don't know what he does because I've never seen any of his videos. And I've seen a couple other guys that are using this thing. But we got this down to, to 
about three or four minutes of drills. And all we were trying to do with this, we were trying to keep from doing this. And we knew this, that's a small target that can be part of the of a, somebody's body. I actually had straps made at Penn State. When I, Penn State, their their budget was so, I, I didn't, I would just think about it and they would just, yeah, money, who cares? Yeah, what do you want? Okay, but what we found was that we could actually hit it at different angles and it would still be part of the body. So we taught the kids to hold it like this, to hit it here, or, or excuse me, to hit it here. Wait a minute, I'm screwing this up. This, I'm trying to hit it over. No, hit, over, it, over, hit it in over, the opening. No. The opening, yeah. The, this side over here. This side yeah, over here, boom, I'm trying man. to hit it. Boom. So, and I would say, okay, hold it like this, hit the opening, hold it this way, hit the opening the other way. We just, we turned it into a pretty good little tool. For, and for about three minutes, it taught us how to get the hand placements that we we're looking at. And it's a small target. So you got to, you know, aim small, miss small. What's that? What's that movie? The Patriot? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, coach. You know what I'm talking about? The guy, the, Mel Gibson, aim yeah, small, it. miss small. Mm-hmm. Okay. Aim That's big, hit target. big. Okay. Yep. You get a big old shield or a big old sled, you can hit it all over the place. Guess what? You're training your kids to flail. You got that little target. They better hit it. You know, whether it's one hand, one hand, or two hands together, you got to keep those hands. What we, we, we got this word. I got this word from um, Dick Anderson at a clinic. He said, when your hands separate from your feet, you've uncoupled them. He said he learned that from the diving coach at Penn State. He said in order to do all these dives and stuff, you had to learn how to use your hands separate from the rest of your body, uncouple them. Well, right away I'm saying, gee, that makes sense. I'm a tight end. I'm running like this. I'm, I'm using my arms to add speed. When I go to catch the ball, though, I can't catch it like this. I got to uncouple my hands. I got to catch the ball with my hands together. I'm still moving. Well, guess what? When I'm boxing, I'm uncoupled. I'm looking for I'm not my feet and my hands are not in sync like I'm running. We don't even call this running. We call it bursting. When you burst out of your fundamentals, Okay, that's what I want. I want to make them realize that when when you when you're running, you've bursted out of your fundamentals. Our fundamentals are this. Number one, protect your own chest. Right? Don't get hit in the face, don't get hit in the chest. Your chest and armpits are handles, handles, just like a suitcase. You you pick up a suitcase without a handle, a handle breaks. You can take that suitcase and put a man in it with a handle and walk around like nothing. Well, guess what? You get in the armpit or under the arm, the breastplate, it's a handle. Protect your handles. Also, make sure you can get the opening when it presents itself. Okay? The, the second fundamental is condense. Make your levers smaller. They're smaller. You can accelerate them faster. Acceleration is 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 speed over distance okay acceleration is stopping starting or changing direction okay how quick can you can you move when you're one of these ice skater girls and you're going into spin they start out like this as they spin the faster they spin the more their hands condense they make themselves smaller it's called a moment arm and that when they make themselves smaller, they spin faster. You've seen it. Yeah, because you know, it's like, like a helicopter. Oh, it's like a helicopter. You're using your your momentum, and then once you get the momentum going, well, you bring it in. You know, here's a better analogy for you. You ever see these tightrope walkers? Yes. Why do they have that long stick? Oh, that's the balance. What do you, what do you mean balance? Why they can't balance without that stick? Uh, no. no. Because they're constricted. I mean, well, that that, that causes you not to. That, that, 
that long pole, okay, is a long, or long arms. And those long arms are harder to accelerate. They're harder to a lever going in a, in a different direction. Yeah, they're levers. It's a lever. And and what what he does is he's slowing down his stability or instability. Okay. When you make that thing shorter, and all of a sudden he's got more instability. We're not looking for balance. We're looking for stability. Stability. Okay? When we play, we're looking for stability. We can control our body better condensed than we can expand it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just one of those things. Now the third fundamental, okay. The first fundamental is protect your own chest, keep your hands tight. Second fundamental is condense. And I didn't want to say stay low because you can lay on the floor and you're low, but you can't do anything. But if you shorten your arms and legs, if you bend your knees and your elbows, you're more condensed so you can accelerate. You can stop and start and turn faster so you can take more advantage of whatever's presented to you. And then the third thing is traction. How do you get how do you get your power on the ground? Because if your power is not on the ground, when you shoot a bullet, that's all momentum. OK. When you're when you're driving your car and you get it into fourth gear or high gear, it's all it's all momentum. The, that engine's barely turning over. But for you to start, you need a lot of power to accelerate. Well, when you're playing football, if if you if you run and, and take a leap at somebody, whatever speed or momentum you've built up, that's that's what you're stuck with. Unless you can put your feet on the ground, you can't add acceleration. You can't increase your speed. You can't slow yourself down, and you can't change your direction. So you got to keep your feet grounded. And how do we do that? Little steps, and we turn our toes out, and we turn our knees out. Now we don't we don't turn our toes so that they're wider than our knees, and we don't stick our knees out so that they're wider than our toes. We put our toes and knees in line but out because what we do is we put more foot on the ground. We put all our, our cleats on the ground. We you can make get our wider. heels and our whole foot. Yeah. It's like a tire. Okay. You, you're, you have a, you have your toes in, in the ground. You're slipping. When, when we play on mud, I don't want to hear one guy tell me it's slippery because they got to stomp those feet into the mud at a, at a slight toe out angle to get the whole foot on the ground and to create traction. And here's another way, here's another thing that we talk about. I weigh about 260. My wife's going to laugh at me. I'm a little, maybe a little more than that. I stand on a scale. The scale says it's 260. Okay. If I move around a little bit, the scale will fluctuate a little bit, right? Okay. But if I take my foot and stomp it like that, that scale is going to jump. By me stomping my feet, stomping my feet, I am adding force to the ground, and the force, the ground is fighting me back. And I get better contact, mechanical contact with the ground, and I have more traction. So we don't talk about, we don't step, we stomp. Okay, we stomp, we, we add force to the ground. And I've gotten to the point where I'm telling guys, you add you add your force to the ground. You go. You block down into the ground. Okay. You want to get use gravity and go down into the ground. And, and what, when you do that, what happens? You condense. So it all kind of fits together. Yeah. I mean, first thing I thought of was when you like people say you have to play with good leverage, but I never thought of this. But the word leverage comes from lever. Oh, that's exactly right. And, now, and then, yeah, go ahead. Well, there's leverage is a funny thing. You levers and leverage are two different things. In oh, my really? Mind. Yeah. Well, think about this. Okay, a lever is a tool. Okay, a lever is a tool that you use to to create force in a circle. Okay, and if you know anything about a crowbar, mm -hmm. if you get, hang on one second, would you grab me that hammer? That hammer in there. She's she's doing a project. 
when you're using a lever, you're multiplying the force that you put into the lever, okay? And it's based on the distance from the fulcrum. So when yeah. you use a hammer like this, here's the fulcrum. You're pulling a nail. Try and pull it out holding it like that. Yeah. Okay, it's hard. The, the input and the output are the same. But when you add length to the input, it makes the output. It, now, you got to move the input lever further. But the output lever's got a lot more force, a lot more yes, force. Okay, so that's a lever. Leverage, the way we explain it to kids, especially freshmen, is this. Okay, I don't know if you see this. Let me, nah, let me, let me push this thing down a little bit. There you go. Okay. All right, so I'm going to make believe that that cup right there is a defensive player. And right now, this is the way we explain it to them. That guy is on my right, okay? This this cup is on my right. I have a, a runner behind me. We're going to run two plays today, fellas. We're going to run one play outside the cup, and we're going to run one play away from the cup, okay? Now, it's the same guy blocking the same guy. Do I block him the same way? No. Why? Because when I go this way, he has leverage on me. When I go this way, I got leverage on him. So the leverage determines the technique. Okay. Right. Yeah, the coach McNally got wanted to know the other day. I got a, z a zero technique, and I'm the center, and I got to base block him. Oh, how do you, how do I do that? And the first thing he asked was, "Where is the ball hitting? Where's the ball being ran?" Oh, it's true. It's, it's true. <laughs> It's a great well, it's question. If you don't have an angle on a guy, you have to create one. Yeah. Well, if the ball is being run way out there, all I got to do is Apache. I got to encircle him. If he, He's got to go on a dead run that way to get to the ball. And if I can get to his side, if I can cut him off, okay, and we learn this. If I go at him, I'm going to have a hard time cutting him off. Yeah. If I go at him at an angle, I'm going to have a hard time cutting him off. But if I encircle him, if I drop my shoulder down and run a circle around him, and that's where the word Apache came from. This guy is, is Colonel Custer, General Custer, and I'm the Apaches. I'm going to encircle him. And if he goes this way, at least I'd be able to catch him. But if he stays right there, I got him cut off. And if he goes that way, somebody else would get him. Now yeah. – I have to run – if I haven't run – the ball's running right behind me, I got to create an angle. Well, how do I do that? Yeah. Well, I can add torque or I can yeah. add flip. Okay, we ch we changed lift to flip because we, we started thinking about this. I was going to take you outside, and I got a tire out there, big tire. Okay, when you flip a tire up, the tire – think of the tire as just like a guy. Mm -hmm. Okay. When it's laying on the ground, it's pretty hard to get it up. You know, you see these guys, they they, they get on their hands and knees and they pick it up. But, but really, a defender is going to be about four feet high. Okay, a good defender. You know, you get in the shoots, it's, we don't me even mess with the shoots. When you're really playing, this is what it looks like. Okay, here's one guy, here's the other. This is They sort of form a four-legged animal, like I said. Okay, well, when you – it's easier for you to flip him up with your elbows in and your thumbs out. Okay. That's, there's no question. This is hard. Oh, Once yeah. you get him flipped up, change. Now you want to, you want to push him over. Sure. You want to, you want to be as long as you can. This is not as long as that. This is not as long as that. Once you've lightened him up by standing him up, once his weight is not doesn't have the benefit of gravity. He's a tree too. When he's teetered, you got you got a problem. Once you get him lifted up, you can push him around, just like that tire. You can roll him. Now, what we learned was this: because of gravity, he's going to give a little ground or he's going to fight back. You're trying to, you know, I'm saying to these kids, lift them up. Well, some of those tires weigh 500 pounds. Yeah, you lift it up. No, I'm flipping the thing, and I'm going to roll it. I'm going to do what we call tear. Now, this is where 
I'll get into arguments with guys. Like if we're running, if we're if we're pass blocking, the quarterback should stay right there. I mm-hmm. can throw. But if we're running the football, I got to tear. I got to keep engaged with this guy, get him in the armpit and tear him. I don't want to throw him. Throwing is the last resort. If I know that if I know that the ball is going in there, I can throw him away and, and you know, like a draw or something like that. Like, you know, take two draw. Yes, sir. You know, okay. But when I got the guy running right up my butt, I want to tear him. It's easier for me to tear him than push him back. And when I stay engaged with him, he can't retrace. It's hard for him. I'm holding him, really. I got him, I got him in here somewhere. You know, you mentioned David Harrison. The yes, guy sir. With, well, he was one of the best tear guys I've ever coached. He t- he was 500-pound bench. He'd get somebody in the armpit and tear his tits off. <laughs> he, was, he was a beast. Six foot tall. He had arms like a seven-footer. And he was as strong as an ox. So the the tearing adds force at an I mean, think about it. If I hit you with a hook, I'm adding force at an angle. If mm-hmm. I jam that, I'm I'm not really hitting you, but if I grab that armpit and lift that shoulder and put you on one foot and use your gravity and just kind of tear you over, I'm dragging you around like a drunk, I'm dragging a drunk out of a bar. If I can get it in there. If, I, if my hands are like this, I'm not going to get it in. Yeah. It, now, you know, there's that the, we made some inroads. I used to be like this all the time. Then we started to add this. Okay. We said, well, here's a guy way over here. Okay. He's way over here. He's not in front of me. And I like to get in front of him. It's going to take me time to get my feet over there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my hand up. We called it a stop sign. Okay. And some guys are doing it with a lockout. I don't know. I, I watch the film. I don't see the lockout. They train it with a lockout, but I don't see it. I see a, the hand get up there. And then we said, okay, this is the long hand. This is going to make contact, at least make contact. I'm not going to do any work. This one's the strong hand. Being as we're attacking this guy in an angle, we'll be able to tear him pretty good. And, we know that, that that's kind of short. We It's strong, but it's short. And this mixed hands, when the guy's not in front of you, same with pass blocking. As soon as I put my inside hand on a guy that's that I'm pass blocking, that's not in, now he's right in front of me. They do it, you know, two hands, it's great. But if he's on the side and he's a jet rusher and I'm trying to do that, I'm going to turn right away. As yeah. soon as I put my hand in, I'm turning. So what I'm going to do is put the stop sign up, and we actually called it a clothesline. I said, don't put it on him. Put it where where he's going to beat you, just like a clothesline, okay? Hang it out there. He's going to chop it. You take that inside hand and just throw him. And that's where we throw. That's where we, you know, do that throw, shot put throw. Okay, that that's where that came from. We, I don't like shot put throw on the run, down, on run plays. I'd rather tear him away. Yeah, because you don't want to create separation where you can get a, uh, you know, that bad I, word that we don't say penalty. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be separated from him on, on, unless I'm, unless I'm assigned to two people, different stuff. Yeah, like you said, the take two on the draw. But I've never been skiing before in my life. But just thinking about you, you're from North, Coach. Yeah. And when you were talking about the O line's feet. When you ski, the skis are like this. But when you want to walk, you take the skis out like that. Have you ever heard anybody say it like that? Because I was just yeah, thinking that in my I mind. Said I said it. Okay. <laughs> a long time ago. But think even better. Okay, you watch a cross-country skier trying to go up a hill. That's what they do. They just dig the edges. In. Yeah. But you seem like a hockey fan. I don't know, Coach. I, I don't I'm. I, I don't even know, Coach. I know Ulf Samuelson because he used to fight all the time. Okay, well, here's the thing about hockey. It's played on ice. Ice yeah, is slippery. Same thing. It's slippery. Okay, when you when you're when you're going for a fast break, the first thing that guy does is he takes that foot, he picks it up, he turns it 90 degrees. I used to call it a 90 degree step, the brace step. When I coached in high school, I called it a 90. 
He takes that foot, he picks it up, and he digs it into the ice, and he condenses, and then he accelerates off of that. Just like roller race. skating. Just like roller exactly. skating. Same premise. It's yeah. Exactly. If you if your feet are like this, you're slipping. You turn them, you dig that edge in, or the wheels, the wheels don't turn, off you go. Well, you just you, – you're a fast learner. I don't know about that, Coach. Well, uh, you, you knew that. You knew the skiing. I, I just think yeah. – I, I just so trying to think. I, I would even think – You turn the toes, turn the tips in, heels out, and it's, it keeps you from sliding too fast. So – you're right. That that was exactly why we did it. That's exactly why we turn our, our feet like that. Yes, yeah, somebody and, and was. Jim, Jim said this a long time ago. When, when you you want to get your insteps in, okay. Well, the easiest way to get your insteps in is is to have your feet that way. You know, have your feet that way. And we all we added was we call it an alligator arm or alligator leg. We added. We, we want that knee bent, okay, just like alligator. You know, we want to be alligator arm, alligator yeah, leg. he's condensed. We want short legs and short arms so that we can accelerate. You got it. And it's just like when you punch somebody. Like, do I want to punch somebody with – even when Coach McNally talked about, like, being a center and blocking a zero technique that you hop back. Um, it's the same thing premised when you're – if you're going to punch somebody, you're going to hop back with your hand before you punch. Well, think about this now, okay? Now, let's we're going to get into load now, <laughs> okay? No, think about this, you coach. I don't defend. even know what I don't even know what load is, but I, I kind of understand what you're saying. Well, Coach McNally said I was above average the other day, and I I felt like that was like you know Michael Jordan telling me I was above average basketball player, coach. Well, it depends yeah. on how well you shoot. Uh huh. You know? But but load is simple, okay? Load is my body weight and gravity reacting to my mass, my body weight, plus my momentum, okay? What force am I generating? Okay, now think about this. I got two legs. One leg can can generate force. The other leg's got to hold me up, okay? If my opponent holds me up, that's fine until he throws me, Okay. The load is the combination of the force that you're generating plus the, your weight, your body weight. So if I'm standing here like this, I, I'm 260. Someone comes and shoves me on the side. I my load is 260. But if he comes and shoves me and I shove and I see him coming and I shove back, my load is 260 plus whatever force I can generate. Whoever generates the most force is the one that's going to get the positive reaction. If we, if we, if we, we're looking for a zero sum, one guy to, we're looking for me to win. <laughs> okay, not him. So one guy's going to win and one guy's going to lose. If we get a stalemate, we've done nothing. We haven't, work is change. We haven't changed anything with a stalemate. Okay. So if you're attacking the, the highest load that that man can generate, you're attacking his mass, which won't change, and his force. If you're doing that, it's like, it's like the, 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 you know, you, you, you're a movie guy, right? The, the I went to go see a movie last night, Coach. That movie is weird as crap. Okay, the 300. in the woods. The 300. Remember the 300? Yeah, I know, I know the Battle of Thermopylae. Okay, so so the Spartans fought a certain way. You know what they did? They locked they, their they, they were in a phalanx. Phalanx. The phalanx was a machine. They turned their bodies into a machine. Yeah. Kind of like when that, they, the, the, just like the riot gear when the police, you know, get together. It's exactly the same. Or just like the Eagles coach when they go to run their quarterback uh, sneak. It's hard to stop. Right. Impossible. Well, it's it's possible. Well, Joe Cullen, Joe Cullen's one of the best def defensive line coaches in the world, and he couldn't stop it. Well, you can stop it, but you can't stop anything else. That's the problem. If you do exactly what they're doing, dive into the ground. Now they have they have the they but have you got the, pushers too. You got people well, that supply more force and and pushers to your defense. You can Ooh. do it. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. The problem is you can't stop anything else. You don't know yeah, if like that guy's going to catch the ball and pop pass or, you know, you just don't know. 
So they've created so much force. How much force are you willing to match them with? Because if if they create a thousand pounds and you create a thousand pounds, it's zero sum. Punt team, right? But if they're creating a thousand pounds and you're only willing to commit five hundred pounds, you're getting run over. It's just the way it is. Well, the point being, if I am trying to do this, it's zero sum. I get nothing out of it. If I'm if I have an angle, if I'm blocking down or blocking out, Paul, uh, Paul, uh, I just I keep forgetting Paul Boudreaux, Paul, Paul Alexander, Paul, Paul Boudreaux is the other great coach that we had at BC. He was a, he was one of our line coaches too. Paul Alexander says, "Hey, blocking out is the same as blocking down. It's just blocking out to the outside. If you have an angle on a guy, you I, got yeah, coach. I mean, is zone true. to the right, gap to the left." Well, yeah. It, well, it's exactly right. Exactly. It's, it's I have people argue with me all the time. I'm like, dude, you're either going right or going left. You're, if you're stepping I mean, your shoulders right, are square. It, well, whether your so, so, wherever your shoulders are, if there's somebody in your gap, you're if you're going if you're stepping right, you got lever on him. You got leverage on him. Okay. If the ball is going this way, yes, you got an angle on him both ways. Okay, let's yes. put that way. Or you're creating an angle. How do you do it? You can only create an angle with your hands. Now, what we one thing we've added, okay, and this is this is something that I started thinking about uh, probably probably around 2011. Started messing around with it and then kind of put it aside and then went back to it around. F- we were playing, uh, we're going to be playing Texas A&M when we were at Ball State, and I started thinking about um, Mayweather. Okay. You know, Floyd Mayweather, the shoulder roll, the Philly roll. And what his deal is, he doesn't protect his chest like this. He protects it like this. He says he's going to expose his shoulder to you, let you hit the shoulder. He's going to protect his head. And he's just looking, and he's going to back up a little bit out of your reach, and he's going to roll that shoulder down and let you hit it. But he's condensed. Boxers condense so they don't get pushed around. And he's... He's protecting his handles. Yeah. We started thinking about that. We said, well, why don't we do that? Why don't we roll the shoulder down and take the target? You know, uh, Jim was talking about this today, and I said it on one of my videos. Those defensive linemen, all they're trying to do is hit that sled. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you give them a sled to hit, they're going to kill you. Yeah, because they're, the they're better away. athletes. They, 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 can, they can apply more force. Let, let me tell you something. That's bullshit. You got a 350 pound guy on either side of the ball. So now, a lot of the offensive linemen, maybe they, they couldn't play defense, but they're all athletes. Yes, sir. They're all athletes. But you let a guy hit you in the chest because you're going like this or like this or like this or whatever, or even if he gets you with your hands down, he's going to push you backwards. That's the end of that. He's doing that. His, he, he's not using a lever, he's just using. It's just like a, a, a guy who's riding a horse, you know, the knights in, in shining armor. Yes, sir. That stick ain't doing any moving. It's All it is is it's transferring force from that horse to your chest. Well, you let that you let that guy hit you in the chest, you're going backwards. There's nothing you can do about it. Now, you might be able to block him, you know, knock him off. But if he, if he lands those hands, you got a problem. So – you know, this going out and blocking somebody like this, if, if he if you can get him on the chest, great. If you get him on the shoulders, maybe. OK, but when he's trying to t- attack us, what we try to do is that. OK, what are you going to hit? I can get one shoulder lower than two and then I can always come back at you once I've avoided your first place. You're trying to get you're trying to get that on me and I'm I'm going yeah no nah. what am I what have I just done I've created an angle for me and I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna hit you at an angle and it might be this angle it might be this angle or it might just be you hit me so hard and I just stay in a rock and this guy comes and kills you my partner comes and kills you my say if I'm the guard there's a three technique right here okay And, you know, he's he's really kind of a 
two gap player. He's not like this. I'm the right guard. He's like this. He's on my right shoulder. Okay. If I lower that shoulder, what's he going to hit? Okay. He's got to move a little bit. He's got to come out of his. John, go back to John Gutekunst. John said, offense is momentum and defense is extension. If I let that guy dig both feet in and extend his whole body, his arms and legs on me, I ain't doing nothing to him. But if he misses, he's exposed. And that's what we found out with the shoulder roll. It, it allowed us to make him miss and come back on him. We weren't hitting him immediately, but we were hitting him with a nice condensed body and short arms. Yeah, it makes me think of two things. I mean, when you said you were at Ball State and y'all got to play against Texas A&M, I yeah. mean, the Mayweather was, thing is – That was it's a almost, bad Friday night, bro. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, so they definitely got better athletes. But, like, oh, yeah. Mayweather, it's almost like they used to teach – they probably still do. When you block a punt or you block an extra point, you make yourself skinny. So you're giving yourself l less surface to get blocked. So it's almost the same thing. It's exactly the same line. Thing. And then exactly. when you're, you're going against Texas A&M and you're at Ball State, you're not going to go uh, chest to chest with those guys because you're not going to win. So well, you're, you're you're not going to go chest to chest with anybody except the DB. You you can't. You got to be physically dominant to to push a guy back. And I, I I hear these guys with the run off the ball, and I watch it. They're pretty good when they've got a guy at an angle. What, you know, I, I wish I could show you my feet. Let me see well, you hop back, right? Is that what you're going to say? Oh, like, no, no. Think now? about this now. Okay. So we do what we call cow tipping. Okay. And cow tipping, the way we do it is this. We we know we have an angle and we know we're going to. I think if to, you tilt it down, we can get your feet, Coach. Let's see. Okay. Let's there you see. go. Okay. So I got a guy at an angle right here. Don't slip, Coach, because you got socks on. That's hard yeah, work. Yeah, I'm going to go slip. I you got don't, a guy you don't have a lot of angle. friction there. I, I Here's the line of scrimmage. I got a guy at an angle. The way I do it is I go like this. Okay. Or I'll, actually what we do now is we go like this. We, we skip, and then we step where we have to step. Jim likes to do this. But in either event, we are getting there as fast as possible. Okay, Jim said, I, I, Jim calls this a gallop, and this wasn't the original gallop. The original gallop was escaping. It was, I'm trying to get away from a guy. I'm keeping this leg up, keeping this leg back, and trying to go that way. Okay, he calls this a gallop. I believe he, 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 can, he can correct me. He calls this a gallop, and it's, 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 it's a type of a skip. The reason I don't do it is if that man goes here and splits me, I'm caught. I can't adjust that leg. As soon as I do that, if he, if he goes here, I got, I'm beat. So I'm still stepping deep, and all of a sudden I'm not getting the advantage of the angle. But when you when you got a guy, when you got an angle, and, and he's getting set up by another guy, go get him. Go get him. Right? Okay? When he's right in front of you, and you don't have the advantage of an angle, create one. How do you do it? Maybe shoulder roll, flip them up, throw a hook on them, do something to, uh, to create angular momentum. When he lines up at an angle, you got him. Okay? Now, if you have to encircle him, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother parameter. But if you can just block this guy because the back's going to run off of you, we call that stovepipe. If the back's going to run off of your block, go get him. Run off the ball. Get there as quick as you can. And, you know, the problem is don't shut yourself off with bad footwork. If I have a guy, if I have a guy that I got to get between my feet and I step dead center at him, he'll escape this way. If I step to get him between my feet, it's a different story. And some people might say, well, that's not a, a vertical step. And I say, well, yeah, I know. There's a, there's a pretty famous football coach that sat down one day and, and told me that his guys don't, don't take drop steps. And I watched his film and I said, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? Because anything that was at an angle, they, those kids knew they had to take 
put their, that man between their feet and they couldn't step right at him. They couldn't lead step right at him. Couldn't do it. And, and if you're, if you're that center again, and you have a zero nose and you go to pick that foot off the ground, you might get that foot down. But if you move that second foot, you're, you're going backwards. So that's all you can do. If you can get that front foot down, maybe you can move them. But if that second step comes off the ground, you're going backwards because that's your ba your brace. What we figured out was both feet back, you can move them as long as that weight's forward. Yeah, and I saw Coach McNally posted something on Twitter. And on your line drill where you studied, like, these guys going one-on-one, -on -one, did, did you see that people lost because they stopped their feet on contact? No. There was none of the, – the guy that moved fastest, the guy that got across the line, the guy that wound his arms up, the, those were no factors. Every one of those things was not a factor in the win. The two factors in the win were hand placement, who got their hands on fastest, okay, and bringing your feet. And we know that – this is where the original thought of lift – lifting – you can't lift something unless your feet come with you. You can't. I can't have my feet away from this chair and lift it off the ground. I can't do it. I got to get my feet close to it to lift it. So the act of lifting, which we call flipping now, because we're flipping the tire, we don't want to actually get this thing off the ground because now we have to move its weight. But if we can flip him up on his feet, okay, we're bringing our feet. You, that's just the way it goes. And by bringing in your feet, you don't fall down. And now you can continue to add force. Okay? So all of those things that, that everybody always talked about, the first guy, the low pads, all that stuff, it was it, – we just checkmarked it. And the, the two things that came up most often were who was able to bring their feet after contact. It didn't matter where the contact was. Now, yeah. we're talking 30 years ago, so – I don't think that film still exists. It was, it would be on a VC VHS tape, but that, those were the two factors. Anybody that got their hands on fast. And I used to, you know, guys will argue, well, this is going to get your hands on fast. Yeah. But mechanically, unless you have, forward. unless you have a, a target that's like this, you can't get it on an angle. When you hit, when you hit something at 90 degrees, okay, that that's a lever. Okay, when I take this 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 hammer and I'm pushing it at 90 degrees, I put 90 degrees of force into the into that lever. That's the most force that it will generate. If I put force at an angle, it won't generate as much force, no matter how, what the length is. It just won't. If I put if I put my hand here, 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 if I put it at 90 degrees, that lever is traveling in a circle. And your, your force is following that the arc of that circle. And that's that's where you get all the force. If if your force is going like this, as it as it as the angle changes, the force will diminish. Try it yourself. Bang some nails into a board and play with this thing. So we wanted to we wanted to apply any kind of angular force at at close to 90 degrees as we could do it. And if you're if you're going to hit somebody in the chest and his chest is straight up and down like that, no problem. Push him. Matter of fact, doing that is, is a bad angle. Mm -hmm. When his chest is down, yes, you want to be, you want to attack him. These are visual aids are not good. Okay. When his chest is down, you want to attack that chest at, at a 90 degree angle. And that will, that will create the most change. Okay, so by being able to by being able to do this, this, all this stuff with our arms, we can ensure that we're getting the optimum angle on the blocking surface we're trying to attack, which is this. If I'm if I'm tearing, you know, guys will say, well, you know, you you don't want ever want your elbow out. Well, if once I get that guy hoisted up, I do want my elbow out because now I want to put the force that way. You follow me? Yes, sir. Because so, if the if the elbow's here, you can't 
apply the force that way. Well, it's just like arm wrestling, right? So arm wrestling, right? You're it's all this lever. Yeah, you're 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 fighting your own lever. When you change that angle, okay, you're gonna push it, push that thing over. Your, your elbow comes off the ground. You now you have more push. Well, I'm following the art. We're we're changing. We're 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 getting into some bad bad uh, uh, analogies. But but look, trust me with this. Try it yourself. Bang some nails in the ground. Get your hammer and change the the, the uh, placement of the input lever, and then change the angle of of the force on the input lever, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. The easiest way to 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 use the lever is at 90 degrees to the lever, the lever arm, the lever arm, 90 degrees. That that creates the most torque. And we're we're talking about torque, which is force in a circle. So I got a video um, called Circular Force. Okay, and some some people may have seen it. It's on my YouTube thing. If you look, I. I think currently we've got a hundred videos going back to probably, probably uh, God, I don't know, 2011 when I when I first I, I first got into a situation where I could get somebody to video and and edit it, it was Ball State, you know. At, when we were at Elon, I could have did it at Duke, but I didn't know all this stuff at Duke. I was like, that was you know 2005. It was still, you know. <laughs> we started to understand about momentum, though, at Duke. We, mm -hmm. we, um, well, that's another. That's a whole other. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to get you to, uh, you know, I, I mentioned it to my friend Shane Reynolds, who told me Bro Scott was going to be watching, and then that, that Bro Scott brought all this to ODU. You know, your med ball stuff, and then yeah. I talked to Zach Hayden, used to be a coach at Verona, now he's at Patrick Henry Roanoke, and both said the med ball guy. So how did you get to be associated with med balls? I mean, you have a med ball well, in your living room, coach. Well, I, like I told you, we, I got caught three times by the AD. Okay. And I figured I was four, one more time with, with blocking shields. I was going to get fired. So I was walking by the weight room. It was six o'clock in the morning. I said to the kids, uh, grab those medicine balls. And at the time they were these hard balls. Okay. And I said, we're going to use those as shields. And we started playing around with them and realized that we could get them at different angles, just like our hand place. We were starting to play with, you know, this goes all the way back to UMass. Where we knew we, we knew we needed tight hands. Okay. I used to call it. Tight yeah. hands. I, I believe Jim, Jim, uh, Jim McNally coined that phrase tight hands. I used to just say it's the V. See the V? Mm -hmm. okay. And guys, some guys will say, well, it's that. I know it's not. It's, it's just like John Gutekunst taught me. My thumbs are in a V. Yeah. Okay. I can do lots of things with that. I can push. I can pull. We called it pull. Okay. I can throw. But that V was, was the deal. OK, you can see I'm protecting myself and and I can approach the chest. Matter of fact, I had a guy named Dan Markowski, who was a giant of a man at um, at UMass. He's actually a he's actually a, uh, an athletic director at UMass. And he would block people like this. He was six foot six and he blocked people like this. I'd see it all the time. Finally, I said to myself, we're going to start doing that. I had a guy named um, named uh, Rodney Austin at Elon, and he was a man, a man among boys. He was just about a six foot three, three hundred, and God knows what monster. He invented the scoop. He invented the double the drop step. I was looking at him and saying, "I know this guy's a beast, but he knocks the dog out of everybody. How's he doing it?" And I started studying him, and he was taking both feet. Again, the guy is at an angle. How do I get in front of a man who's not in front of me? Okay, and I'd like to stay square because I'd like to I'd like to get him hooked. The key to the C gap is is the three technique. If you get that three technique leveraged, you got you got him. But the problem is if you uncover him, like let's say you Apache him, it's hard for the center to cover him up. So we we said we wanted to stay square. How do I get my head on his outside? 
and get him, get in front of him. And we, we said, well, the, the drop step will do that for us. But he said, look, I'm going to take – he didn't say. He just did it. He, he said – he said – he showed – you know, he, he didn't even know what he was doing. He just did it. And I didn't know what he was doing until until I started studying it. But he would go. He'd take that, that, that brace and he'd take that other – we, we, the way I explained it, I'm putting both feet in the same – you know, everybody calls it a bucket step, step in the bucket. Okay. Well, first place, don't don't shift your weight back on the you're dead right now. There's nothing you can do. I don't care what you do with your other foot, you're dead. Do not put weight on that foot. Don't put weight on that foot. Step in the same bucket. That foot moves, and now the weight moves. Okay. So put both feet in the same bucket. That's the scoot. That's I mean, hang on a second. See if that helps. I mean, b basically, he's moving back to create leverage. To create he's not leverage. moving back at all. He's not. That's the key. He does not. His weight. Does Can you not do it sideways? Back. Can you do it sideways? Well, I can't do it. With, I can't do it without falling forward. But here's the point. If I go like this, let me go this way because I just had my hip replaced. <laughs> I'm going to put this chair out here to hold myself up. If I go like this and I move my weight backwards, I'm going back. There's nothing yes, I can do about it. I, I'm dead. I get hit in the chest. I don't care if I'm bent over. I don't care. if It doesn't matter. I'm going backwards. I want to take my foot without my weight, yes. and I want to induce a teeter. When I put the other foot in the bucket, if I don't have something to hit, I fall on my face. So what we found was don't stuck, don't even try to train the scoot unless you have another guy coming at you. And I have a I have a couple of videos on that. But the, the scoot, again, do not don't talk about going backwards. Don't talk about stepping backwards. Don't say backwards at all. Don't do not say backwards. Do, especially don't say backwards in a staff meeting. Do not say backwards. <laughs> say deep. Okay? Step deep. Step deep. Step deep. And do not put weight on that foot because you're going backwards. Backwards means your weight is going wherever your weight. If your weight's going forwards, you're going forwards. If your weight's going backwards, you're going backwards. If your weight's going sideways, you're going sideways. You can move your foot. Yeah. Deep and not go backwards. Do yeah. Not, do not allow that weight to shift onto that foot. Now just stomp that foot in the ground, and the you've induced a you're a tree. Yeah. Okay? And when you when you drop a tree, this is how it goes. Okay. So you're you're just when you teeter, you're just about you're just about to go down, but you catch yourself because now you're bringing your feet because of that action. And you know whether it's whether it's a long and a strong or or double double strongs, you're bringing your feet by flipping that man up. You're the act of flipping him up brings your feet forward. You're going to win. If you watch my CGAP video of, from Ball State, we get a lot of pancake blocks out of the guards on, against three techniques because the three techniques are running to try and catch up with us. They've they've broken. They, they don't have their feet dug into the ground. They're trying to they're trying to catch up. And boy, they're, it's just like pushing a, a it's like pushing a, a cart in a supermarket. They got wheels. You're spinning them all over. But you get more you will get more pancake blocks from the scoot than anything. And you know our, my early videos, everything was about that. And I started to get yelled at so much. And I said, well, we don't block like this. We don't block like this. We block like this. Yes. This is how we block. This is what actually is happening. Not this. This is just a drill. And so I, I started to, to change the drills around a little bit. But you do not, do not say backwards. Don't. Now, when you're pass blocking, you know, there's different types. The jump set, the upset, all those you have to go backwards. 
that's the problem with offensive line play. If you put a, if you get in a four point stance, like like you're running you're running quarterback sneak at the at the Eagles, those guys are like a four point stance. They couldn't pass block or do they couldn't go sideways. <laughs> they they can only go forwards. Wishbone offense. Okay, when you're in a real stance, and we went we were in a two point stance for a lot of the time that I coached uh, with Pete Lembo. Your weight has to be over your feet or you're going to fall. I mean, there's nothing. Yeah. You know, when you're in a three-point stance and you put weight on your hand, you can't pass block. You can't pull. You can't do anything. So you're in a two-point stance, whether your hand's down or not. How do you get your feet, how do you get your weight going where you want to go? Well, it's easier to move your feet than to move your weight. It's just the way it is. It's it's. There's no... There's no, you can't argue with it. <laughs> it's just the way it is. I, mean, I can move my feet. John Gutekunst told us this in 1983. You know, who just, did he learn from? I don't know. He, I mean, he he's he is. I've been blessed by being around brilliant men. Brilliant. Okay, McNally, brilliant. Uh, John Gutekunst, who was a, you know he was brilliant. He was the head coach of Minnesota. He coached with Lou Holtz. Brilliant man. Okay, Callahan's, I've been able to talk to him over the years here and there. Brilliant. I mean, these guys are so smart. Uh, as a matter of fact, I said this the other day. I don't know any good football players that are not smart. Now, they might be impulsive. They might do stupid things. They might make bad decisions. But none of them are dumb. Not one of them are dumb. Think about it. You, and think about the highest level. Like those guys at Penn State, they were all going to be doctors and this. And the ones that weren't, the ones that weren't good students, they were so, so players. They might have had a lot of talent, but they couldn't play together. They couldn't do it. They, they, uh, they didn't understand the concept of teamwork. You know, you can, you can lose a game all by yourself, but you can't win it all by yourself. you got to have your team guy with you. Now that's that's where we talked about the concept of toughness. You know, um, we say that uh, talent is the ability to perform. Performance is what you're selling. Toughness is the ability to perform no matter how you feel. Say okay. that again, Coach, because that was good. Okay, that was, well, say that whole line again. It's it's a it's a it's a little ditty that I put together. Uh, we were out on the field in like 100 degree weather up in Massachusetts. It gets hot up there in the summer. And these guys were just stretching away, like no big deal, getting ready for like the the 18th practice. And I'm saying, these suckers are tough. They do it no matter how they feel. They must be miserable. And it dawned on me, that's toughness. Talent is the ability to perform. Performance is what you're selling. People come to your stadium, they pay tickets to see you perform. Toughness is the ability to perform no matter how you feel. Okay. It's too hot. I don't care. It's too cold. I don't care. We're winning. I don't care. We're losing. I don't care. My leg hurts. I don't care. I'm not going to let my personal feelings. Now my physical feelings, I'm, I broke my leg. I can't perform. That's the end of me. Take another guy, bring him in, but I'm not going to let how I feel change what I do. Okay. That's, that's, that's what, it, that's basically what, what, what it's like that Jocko willing. Good. Like, you know, good. I don't know who he is, but sounds good. Yeah, he was a Navy seal and he's oh. got a podcast and wrote books and he's got this whole thing. Doesn't matter what happens. Good. And like Trevor Lawrence threw two picks in the playoffs. And that, that was like their thing that Doug Peterson had showed him was good. Like that's what he said after he threw two picks, he said, good. When, they, once, they it, once, it, once it happens, you can't change it. You can only you can't change what's going to happen. You can only change what's happening. Bob Wiley said that a long time ago. Uh, he said that to me. He said, "He said, live in the moment. Hmm. Teach them to live in the minute that they're living in, not thinking about the score, not thinking about thinking about what they're going to do and who they're going to do it with, who they're going to do it with." <laughs> okay. And now, now, 
we say, okay, so toughness is the ability to perform no matter how you feel. Discipline is performing the way we perform. So in other words, don't do it the way you do it. Do it the way we do it so that you can work with somebody else, a, a teammate. And when two or more people work together, that's a team. That's teamwork. So going with discipline, this was the analogy that we use for discipline. I got a, uh, I got a brick wall or concrete wall. And, and I say, one of my guys, I say, I want you to knock a hole in that wall. And he goes, okay, coach. And I said, well, good, get at it. And he goes, how am I supposed to do it? I said, just run into it. You'll knock it over. Just run into it. Just run. You'll knock it over. And he bounces off and gets a concussion. So I start thinking about it. I get him a hammer, sledgehammer, and I show him how to use it. Okay. And he uses it. And pretty soon he knocks a hole in the wall. And then I say, okay, well, that's good. I need another hole over here, but I need it fast. And I need it bigger than this one. So I'm going to get Johnny over here. I'm going to give him a hammer because we know that the hammer works. And we're going to knock a hole in the wall. So you, Jimmy and Johnny get over there and they start swinging that sledgehammer. And they're hitting each other. They're hitting themselves. They're hitting their fingers. And I go, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, 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 whoa, whoa. Here's what's going to happen. Jimmy, you're going to stand over to the right. Johnny, you're going to stand over to the left. <laughs> when I say one, Jimmy, you swing the, your hammer. When I say two, Johnny, you swing your hammer. Okay? You swing it the way I showed you. Well, Jimmy says, well, I don't want to swing it lefty. And I say, I don't care. You're swinging it lefty because that's where you're at. That's, that's your role today is to line up lefty and swing that hammer lefty. And Johnny, your role is to line up ready and swing that hammer ready. Okay, you guys ready? Okay, here we go. One, two, one, two, one, two. Pretty soon we got a we got double the hole in half the time because we did it the way we were supposed to do it, the way it's done at at hammer time. Hmm. Okay. And we did it together. So like I said this a, a little bit back. You have a um you know, you have a, 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 a way of doing something, okay? It's the way. We, we, don't, we don't talk, we don't call it too many things. We call it one thing. We don't, we don't let the kids use it. Once, once we decide what this is, once we decide, if we say that this thing right here is a grapefruit and we have to call it a grapefruit, everybody's got to call it a grapefruit. Every son of a gun in that room better call this a grapefruit. And when I say grapefruit, they don't have to see what I'm talking about. They know it's a grapefruit. They know what a grapefruit is. Okay. When I say scoot, I don't want to, I don't want a, a kid saying, oh, you mean reach? I don't know what reach is. You, mm -hmm. We don't use reach. We scoot. We scoot around here. And when I say scoot, that's what I mean. And when I'm on the sideline with 15 guys and five of them are bleeding out the nose and they're they're hurt and this, and I, I said, ah, these guys are fine. They're tough. And they I said, what happened out there? And and Billy says, well, I tried to reach them hard. And I go, what the hell are you talking about? And I said, what, did you scoot? Yeah, coach, I scooted, but it didn't, you know. I said, okay, you scooted. Well, you know, maybe, maybe this and the other. But all 15 people – know what I'm talking about. They know what he's talking about and we can communicate. Okay. We don't have to see it. We can talk about it. We have a language. And that to me is again, talent is ability. Okay. So <clears throat> if you have ability, but you don't have toughness and you don't have a, a way, you can't be a team. You can't do it. OK, so and then we, we you know, there's a there's a, a philosopher. Uh, I always screw up his name, Eli, Eli Wiesel. And he says, what's the opposite of love? And everybody says, hey, he says, now nah, the opposite of love is indifference, because if I love somebody or hate them, I'm thinking about them. But if I'm indifferent to them, they don't even exist. <clears throat> and I, so I turn that around and say, OK, what's the opposite of toughness? And everybody goes, well, weakness was, you know, and 
I go, no, no, selfishness. Because I might have the talent, I might have the skill, I got all the ability in the world, but I just don't feel like doing it today. I don't feel like it. And guess what? If you don't feel like it, it ain't going to get done and can't have a team. Can't have a team. So leverage and team, leverage and toughness are two things we talk about all the time. Who's got the leverage? That's how we do it. Toughness, don't show up here. To, I don't care how you feel. When you're sitting in the room, I don't know what you you're thinking, I have no idea what you're thinking. I don't care what you're thinking. I only care about what you're doing. Okay. Nobody cares about what you're thinking. You could be thinking about your girlfriend. You could be thinking about anything you want. But when you go, you do it. You do it the way we do it together. And we got a chance. I'm talking a lot, coach. I, 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 uh, well, so I mean, I'm listening because ago, it's true. Yeah. Well, it's true. Well, it's because. You know, it's guys true, that are tough. True. Yeah, I mean, it's guys who are tough can be coached. In order to give order, what is it that, that my dad used to tell me? In order to give orders, you have to be able to take orders. So, I mean, in order to be in a position to be tough or to tell other people what to do, you have to be able to take coaching. And well, you know, if you're that, selfish, that, then you think you're smarter than the coach, or you think you know more than the coach, or you care about yourself more than the coach or the team, and that. That destroys teams. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. I, I, I just did a video the, the, about a week or two ago. I I never tell them that we're family or we're this or that. I say, well, we're kind of like a union, like a brotherhood. We have to depend on each other, okay? And uh, we have to hold up our end of the bargain and – if we don't, none of us are going to win. It's just the way it is. It's like the seals. I mean, it's they the do it from the guy all, next to them. It all they, comes from that. Yeah, it all they do it from the they do it for the guy next to them, and it's not. And they're really not their brother, but they put in the same amount of work, and they know that the other guy is dependent on them. It, it's exactly. I, I you know it's a, I I think I think that football football per se and offensive line in particular. We're the last line of uh, of defense in this culture, other than the military guys. You know, we. I hate it when people say it's a war. Football is not a war, but it's not a game either. It's I don't know what it is, but uh, we we require a lot from these kids, and they give it willingly. Now they they might they might get pissed off. It's too hot, coach. What we got to do that again? And they got to trust you, you know. I mean, the first thing that comes, cooperation builds trust. When they when they cooperate with me, but if I keep making them do stupid stuff, <laughs> you know, they're not gonna they're not gonna ever trust me. They might cooperate, they might listen out of respect, but they're not gonna trust me. Eventually, you got to show them that it works. <clears throat> and when you when you build that trust, they'll listen to you. You know, they'll, they'll listen to you. But I say to them, man, you ain't playing for me. You're not playing for the head coach. Maybe you're playing for your mom or your dad, but I don't think so. The guy you're playing for, the guy's next to you. You don't want to let them down. Because if you do, you know, you, now you might lose. Okay, you lost. Deal with it. Let's move on. What do we do? Is at the end of the world, you're still breathing, aren't you? Nobody put a bullet in your ear. You're, it's not like a, it's not like the end of the world. Are you tough? Oh, you're tough. Okay, so we'll sh let's show up tomorrow and, and get back to it. And if it's the last game of the year or the last game you ever played, well, that's life, bro. Hmm. But don't let that feeling change who you are. That's character, right? Integrity is doing your job no matter whether anybody's looking or not. Character is being yourself, no matter who's who's looking at you or not. That's why I tell them. I say, look, <clears throat> integrity is like this. You got a body, right? If I cut your hand off, could you still play football? Yeah. How about your other hand? Could you still play football? Yeah, coach, I couldn't hold, but I could probably play. How about if I cut your, your foot off? Could you play? No, coach, I couldn't. 
but could you help somehow? Yeah, I could move the dummies. I could do. How about if I cut your head off? Could you play? No, coach. You, what, what are you being crazy? I said, well, the team is like a body. Okay. Some parts of the body are more important than others, but all parts are important. If I lose my hand, I'm not going to be as good. If I lose my foot, I can't play at all, but I can help. If I lose my head, I can't do nothing. I can't help. I can't do anything. So whatever your role is in this body, you play that role. You, you That's integrity. My role is left tackle. I don't want to be a left tackle coach. <laughs> your, role, your role is a center. I, coach, I don't want to be a center. Too bad. That's your role. Are you going to do it? Uh, yeah. Are you going to do it? Yeah, I'll catch. I'll do it. <clears throat> you know what? Do it as best as you can, and you're the right guy. Uh, you know, all these coaches, um, they asked Coach McNally, you know, one guy asked, Coach, uh, could you give me all the coaching points for mid-zone, offensive <laughs> line yeah. and running back? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've <laughs> talked to you, and I've talked to Coach McNally, and – it seems like to me the greatest offensive line coaches, they're not big picture guys. They are technicians. They're they're small picture. Like if I'm a guard, I got a guy inside of me. I got a guy head up. I got a guy outside of me. I got a plus backer, a stack backer, a minus backer. Well, and then like, go. what's I'm the gonna, techniques? You know, talk about that. I'm going to fight you on that one. Okay, go ahead, coach. Okay. So, you know, leverage is advantage. That's what, That's our thing. Who's got the advantage? Well, on, on this play, on this play, he has. On this play, I have. Okay. Leverage is advantage and leverage determines technique. Well, guess what? That safety, this guy might look like he's going to do something, but that safety spins down. And even though he's on your outside, chances are he's going inside. Mm -hmm. So we tell him, we, I never say to them this. I say to him this. I don't, I don't know anything about martial arts or anything like that, but I talked to, I talked to a couple of guys. And they want to see the big picture. Mm. They, it's not, it's not like shooting a gun. It's like, I, I, I have to be able to hit something without looking at it. Okay. I have to see the picture. If that safety comes down, it's going to mean something to this guy. If that safety goes over there, if both safeties go over there, I don't care what he looks like he might do there's a good chance he's going to do it based on those safeties. That linebacker is supposed to be over the guard, and all of a sudden he's cheating over to the, to the tackle. <clears throat> Something's up. We, 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 we say that's a bandit. It's like a burglar. He's not supposed to be there. What's he doing over there? Something's going on. Um, you know, I get, a, I get a four eye, and there's no press on the outside linebacker. Well, that guy ain't going inside. He's going outside. Mm-hmm. Anticipate safety comes down. Well, maybe that outside backer's coming. Safety's over there. That guy's going to contain. If if we show pass, he's going to contain. So I I don't. <coughs> when when we're talking technique, we're very specific. We have a thing called the rock. Jim used to call it demeanor. It's just the way you are. A boxer. He's he's he's. Carries his body in a certain way. He's in he's in battle mode. Okay, he never you know. do that. You're resting. You're gonna get beat up. You get hit. You're gonna get beat up. Battle mode. But your big eyes. Okay, your bright eyes. Not, not big eyes. You don't. Let, big eyes means you're being overwhelmed. Bright eyes means you're paying attention to every little detail detail that can tell you something. You got a zero nose. Safety spins down. The tackle's calling it. He's calling hard, hard, hard. We, we had different codes. I'm not going to give you the codes. But that, if the safety spins down on the left tackle, he's going hard, hard, hard. The right tackle's going soft, soft, soft. If they both spin down, guess what? Blitz zero. <laughs> right? Those guys come down, and, and they're capping linebackers both at six yards or seven yards deep. We got problems, you know? And – so, I, you know, when we teach protection, we put the lineman and the quarterback in the room and we put up five linemen, four open set, and we put the defense with two high safeties. And we go, okay, 
we're going to point the back, the, the backer that we think is coming and we're going to put the lineman on him. So, so we don't have like a zone side and man side. We just have a point. We, we don't even call it a mic. We say if whoever we point to, if it's four down, the linemen are going to take those four guys plus the guy we point to. Could be the corner. Could be the safety. So the, we look at the, we look at that and we put it's just a straight four down uncovered center and we start we go okay two high safeties outside backers who's coming and they look at me and they go wow I don't know coach I said well if the if the quarterback points the middle linebacker is that good yeah yeah chances are he's okay okay this safety spins down to the left who and the right the right linebacker is out on the slot, and the left linebacker is on the slot. Who's coming? The mic. No, no. Who's coming? Why is that guy down here? Okay. The will linebacker is coming. We're going to point to him. So that tackle is going to take him. All right? They spin the other way. Who's coming? Him. Yeah, well, we're going to point to him. So we're going to slide that. We don't slide. We just say tackles got him. Guard's got the end. Center's yeah, got you the tell them what man. It's oh, like- yeah. Yeah. And then we, we have a thing called rewind. There's two things that we, we have. Uh, but rewind was this. Okay. And it started out as pass, and it, and it changed to – it changed. We added it to run, too, and it's been pretty good. You see my guys kind of step this way, and they come back blind, and they, they chip people back. That's rewind. What it means is it's just like you're watching a video. I start over here, and then I, I push the button, and I go back to where I started from. Well, that's rewind. So if I'm the tackle, the right tackle, and I'm setting an outside backer, and I have a defensive end in front of me, if I vacate that defensive end to set the backer, and he comes, everybody's happy. But if I vacate that defensive end to set that backer, and he doesn't come, I'm dead meat. Can't help. I I might be able to dive back in, but I can't. I can't really help. I can't take it off the guard. But if I'm the right tackle and I'm setting that linebacker and I set this way and don't vacate, okay, I don't vacate until the whole thing unfolds. If that guy hits it, I can I can move out to him or I can let him come to me because he's a weenie. But if he if he cops out of there, if he buzzes, guess what? This this guy's probably going to contain. Well, if he contains and I've, I haven't vacated him, I've stayed pretty much in front of him and protected myself from him, I can grab him. If I can grab him, the guard can go back and re, we call that a rewind. Okay, I rewind on the end. End's coming to me. Why not? The guard says, oh, okay, I'll rewind. I'll grab the tackle. The center goes, oh, great. I'm going to back up a little bit and see if I can help on this side. I'll help whoever's there. And when we help, we don't go like this. We don't dive in. We go like this. Boom. And we give, we chip, we lower ourselves, we make ourselves like rocks, and we just boom, and we sh- we stone that guy. Half of it is we're immovable, and we add just a little, like a karate, like a little punch. Okay? That six-inch punch, that, that who's that guy? Bruce Lee, the six-inch mm-hmm. punch. It wasn't about this. It was about this. It was about, I'm, I think the Tai Chi, they call it Fajin, F-A-J-I-N. That's the only big word I use today, right? Except momentum. Screw that up. I'm a little dizzy. Uh, you need to get something to drink? You need something to eat? I'm good. So you like no, to put the water right here. I'm, I'm kidding. I, I'm kidding. It's okay. Here, you, uh, you like to put the center to the side of the blitz. Uh, whoever the most likely the blitzer is and even front. Cause I asked coach uh, McNally about this and I don't even know if I should say, but there was another line coach I was talking to and he said he'd like to put the center to the side of the three technique. Cause he can help the, the a gap player and still get, get in his eyes, you know, well, the three techniques. So he's not blocking it by himself. Here, here's the, here's the thing that you're talking about some, you're talking about some particulars. Okay. Yes, sir. So let's say I got a three, and a, and a one or two eye, whatever you want to call it. Yes, sir. Okay. And and I know that the three, I'm going to the side of the three because the backer is that way. Okay. If I, if I move too far to the three, 
I get picked by the one. So what I'm going to do is, I, even though I might drop this leg, because I believe, like Jim does, I believe in whatever way you're going, drop that leg. Yes. But he, he wants to jump now, too. But, but I, I'm not going to move away from this guy. But I, I, I'm moving to what we call red light. Okay, and red light means, I'll tell you what it means in a second. I'm not going to vacate this dude. Why should I? I'm not going to shut the guard off because I'm my responsibility is over here. But because this is a three technique, I got plenty of time to get over there. If that three technique is going to spike, I'm going to see it. I, I, and as long as that leg is back, I can pick him up. Okay, if the guard is set in the end, he's, he's going to set that, that three technique with his hand but he's looking at the end, and he'll make this guy go to me as a center. If I set, if I set this way, because the linebacker's here, I got the two eye. Okay, I'm going to set with that foot back, and I got time to square up if that man does whatever he loops, whatever. Okay, but when I'm setting this way, if I go like this and get picked, okay, let's say that three, three, they they do a TN. I'm dead. So I don't want to get picked. I want to be here. It's not, to me, it's not, you know, that coach, whatever he does, he's doing. It's not so much for help. It's to keep me from getting picked by the guy that's my closest threat. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. It, okay. it does. And if nothing comes, you get a little depth. You know? I mean, and I don't know how long you've been doing it, but, you know, Coach McNally, um, he posted about, you know, the guard um, losing his post foot and changing his post foot. And I kind of had the same question before. If I'm playing right guard and we're full sliding to the left and I have an A-gap player, would my post foot change? I asked a coach about that maybe a couple years ago, and the coach was like, well, I really don't coach that. But I was watching the Super Bowl with my team, and I thought that it was the right guard, I believe. It's the kid from Oregon State from the Eagles. He had an A-gap player, and they were sliding away from the A-gap, and I thought he lost his post foot. But now, after meeting Coach McNally, I'm seeing that the guard is actually changing his post foot, which it makes 100% um, sense to me because if you got an A-gap player, you're not going to get your um, inside foot inside of that guy. Well, I, I, you you you, you kind of changed it on me for a second, but let's say I'm going full gap away from the three technique. Yeah. The tackle is coming to the three technique, right? Yes. Okay. So I got nothing here. I got nothing. Right? There's no nose. There's no nothing. There's space. We call it red light. Okay. I want to get that foot back. I want to get the foot to the way I'm going back. And I want to give presence with this foot. I don't want this guy, I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be posted like this because I get shut off. I get hit, I get shut off. I want to, I want to, but I don't have to move to the center. I don't have to, I don't have to leave. I could just hang out. And I don't want to shut the tackle off. And the tackle is coming. He's going to drop the inside foot or, you know, I, I don't buy, I don't, Jim loves this stuff. And, 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 you know, if, 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 the upset. Yeah, if you're a right, if you're a right guard and you got an A gap player and you're full sliding to the left, and, and All right. So I'm a right guard. I got an A gap player and I'm full sliding to the left. I'm going to drop the inside foot. Yeah, and, and, and I, now he's got the up foot thing, the, the upset. But I, I think you wind up. I think you wind up getting picked. I don't know. I haven't, like I said, I haven't coached in three years, so I don't know. <laughs> so what about if I'm the right guard and the center's going to the left and I got an A gap player? I never knew that the right guard was changing his post foot. I would um, do it. I, yeah. I dropped the left foot. When did, when did people start doing that, Coach? Because I'm I'm a high school coach in Richmond, Virginia. I guess I hadn't been studying offensive line play hard enough. Well, I I, I, I don't know when people start doing it, but our deal, everything that we do was was designed for, for two things, okay? No TFLs. Do not go backwards. No sacks. Okay, and I think I think uh, our when I coached offensive line at, at Elon and Ball State, we were national like top five every year in in those two things: no TFLs and no sacks. And I, I'll take I'll I'll give the the credit to the quarterback for no sacks, but no TFLs was was 
the footwork. Yeah. And I think the I think that the footwork, the idea of the footwork was the same. If I'm moving left, my left foot's deeper. Okay. If I if I do what Jim calls an upset, an upset, I think that's good, but I, I'm not I'm I'd like to see it. I'd like to coach it. Okay. What what I don't what I don't like, okay, is if I'm moving to my left and I and I'm I'm going to a guy that's that's not that's on the center and I try to put this hand in right away because now I get picked on this side. Okay. I like that. And I, and then center, if he's if he's going to the left, don't get off that nose right away. If you're if you have nothing to go to, just just hold hold space, put that hand up. Why be in a hurry to why be in a hurry to to enter a void? Don't 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 be in a hurry. Okay. Give that guard a little presence. Make that guy go to the guard. Now, you know, you, you, some of these guys you talked about about uh, Joe Cullen and, and that kid that he's coaching that that giant. I know Joe Cullen. I work with him at UMass. So, so did you and, coach with Coach Reed? Yeah, I coach with Coach I Reed. I love Coach here. Reed, Coach. Yeah, he's he. Uh, those guys are they're legendary guys. They're legendary, Joe Cullen, Coach. Joe Cullen is the, and Jimmy Reed are like as good as it gets. I mean, Coach, I used to, I remember going to watch Joe Cullen before the Richmond games, Coach, and his face was like this. And then, yeah, I mean, he animal man. When when he played, when I was at Northeastern. My guys would come off the field and say, "Coach, there's something wrong with the nose guard." Like, What's he, what are you talking about? He's crazy, Coach. He's crazy. And if you ever saw him lead a stretch, <laughs> I saw it at Richmond, Coach. I was a kid watching. Scared that he would scare yeah, was, people. He'd scare him. Yeah, I mean, Mark Megna. Um, you know, played for him. And Mark was from up there and from Fall River. I remember. And he was an undersized nose guard. But who was the D line coach that Coach uh, Reed told me that he got uh, Coach Cullen to go study under or meet? Because he Coach Reed told me that that D line coach was an animal. Whoever it was, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to have to ask Coach Coach Jim, Reed. Jimmy Jimmy Reed worked with some great people. Uh, one of them was, I think, a guy named Deke Pollard, who was that's a tilt him. Guy. That's him, coach. Yeah, tilt guy. Yeah. Savage. Sir, Syracuse. Uh, he, uh, you know, he's in that Syracuse family. You know, uh, Paul Pasqualoni and all them. I mean, those guys are all. They're all, uh, you know, um, the great uh, coach at uh, from from Maine. That uh, Syracuse. Uh, what the hell is his name? I can't believe I can't remember it. McPherson. Uh, McPherson, yeah, they're all McPherson guys, hard as nails and just, yeah. J J Joe Cullen, as a player and a coach, and yeah, the the, the key to 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 me to a successful coach is is getting the kids to perform, and you know, no matter what you're coaching, you lead step, drop step, 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 step. <laughs> if they're doing it and it's working, you're a good coach. It, matter of fact, if they're doing what you're coaching and it's not working, you're a good coach, but you're a dumb coach. But if if you're if you're doing something that's working and they're doing it the way you're coaching it, you're a good coach. And Joey, Joey, I, you know, now I know he's been a coordinator, everything else. He's, you know, and Jimmy Reed is as good as it gets, you know, good as it gets anywhere. Um, you know, when I went to UMass, I was amazed. That you want to talk about. Organization and toughness, you know, just those guys. Oof. But anyway, neither here nor there. I don't, I don't want to blow smoke up everybody's butt. But um, yeah, Coach, uh, we got a question here okay. from the bald Coach K, and th this is the coach that uh, he complained that Coach McNally didn't follow him back on Twitter. So then uh, Coach McNally said, uh, Coach K. Um, I'm going to follow you back. Stop being a, va a vagina. Yeah. He, he tweeted that, you know, but he, he used the other term. Um, yeah, and that yeah. was legendary. But he says, who is your favorite O-line coach after McNally? You've already talked about Paul Alexander and Paul Boudreaux. And uh, what was the other coach's name for Boston College? And he's, he's down in St. Pete, coach. He lives right on the water, Tampa Bay. 
Well, uh, the, the guy, the guy that, I mean, you know, there's so many great coaches, you know, Aaron Cromer, Callahan, McNally. You know, uh, I didn't have a lot of dealings with this guy, but uh, he ride, he rode motorcycles and I sort of rode, I ride motorcycles and, you know, he was a great uh, player for the 49ers and he, uh, Ooh. Howard Mudd. Uh, yeah. And, and if you, if you watch his guys uh, over the years, you want to talk about innovation and, and uh, just doing things like uh, the way he blocks a nose guard on sweeps, you know, he throws them up the field and then he spin. Well, he doesn't do anything anymore because he's passed away, but he'll throw the guy. He, he literally, if, if the sweep is going to the left, he's the right guard is taking the nose and throwing him up the field and then goes and junctions him. You know, he just runs down the line and catches him further down. You kind of like he rat techniques him, coach. He ear hole shots him. Exactly. Uh, Man, what just, a way, I mean, because you're basically throwing him away from where the, the ball's going and then you're, you're going and boom. You're changing him. You're changing him with by adding force at, a, at an angle. Can't fight the force. Yeah. Think about I, I got, it. I got to watch what I say because one of my uh, friends told me, they said, Troy, you, you can't be saying that you know all the Coach McNally's drills from Buddy Ryan. Like the ones that are like boom, 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 boom. Then you blow a whistle, and then a not, another guy comes in there and gets a shot on the ball carrier. And he, and then he's like, you can't be laughing about concussions and CTE. I mean, dude, it's Coach McNally. How can you not laugh? I, I mean, I think, I think that – But the ear hole shot. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, you, 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 this – the, it was it was barbarous. <laughs> what we used, what we did we we went twenty days full pads in the spring. Yeah, we went three days. Oh, the guys were three days. I mean, yeah, you know, guys would get hurt. Uh, First day of practice, boom, boom, they'd yell, boom. They'd yell at you if you if you uh, stop the drill. And guy breaks his leg. Just the way it was. You know, Move it up five. Different time. But there were more bodies too, and they were smaller. <laughs> yeah, I mean. You know, I, I, you know, like I said, I was a backup guy, but I was around some dudes now. Fred Smurlis, I mean, guys were, they were savages, you know. And uh, I I happened to be in attendance. Uh, uh, I was just thinking about this today. Earl Campbell. Okay, so we're playing Texas at Boston College, and, and uh, everybody's excited, you know, big top 10 team coming to, coming to Boston, the whole bit. <laughs> and it's camp, and, and uh, somebody gets word that uh, Roosevelt Leaks, their great fullback, got hurt in preseason and would not be playing. And instead, they were going to replace him with some freshmen. So everybody was excited. Well, that freshman was Earl Campbell, and he's still out there running somewhere. I think he rushed for 150 yards that day. And then, then we, we, I remember we, we were playing Pittsburgh at when I was, a, I think, a freshman. At the time, you couldn't dress or anything like that. And it might have been sophomore year. I don't know. I wasn't dressing anyway. And uh, Pittsburgh comes rolling in, and we, we didn't know anything. They beat them the year before. They beat the, the dog out of them. BC did. They come rolling in with a new coaching staff. They come out of the huddle with these like four foot splits and they got this little teensy weensy running back and they give him the ball. He gets a yard, he gets another yard. They give him the ball, he gets, a, they give him the ball 55 yards standing up. You know who that was? I don't know. Coach Tony Dorsett. Exactly. Yeah. Just keep handing it to him. Coach It's like a, it's like a, what well, is it? Like a dike. Like the, the it's yeah. eventually going to bust. There's a hole. Boom, well, boom, the defensive boom. linemen were they were so far apart from the, uh, from each other. They had splits like as big as, the, and it was just like this guy. And he when he got past the linebackers, oh, it was gone. Crazy. Home yeah. run hitter. Yeah, so yeah. coach, like like an undersized defensive line that can move and stunt and slant and not give you their pads d doesn't engage like. Does anybody do that? Well, I think I think you do that if, because that's who you have. Yes. Okay, but I think I think big, strong, fast guys are better than than little small, strong, fast guys. Yeah. Yeah. Big, yeah, I mean, yeah. 
and and I think I think weightlifting is important. I think uh, I think conditioning. I think that stamina is important. Uh, you know, being that's another thing. Like Jimmy Reed's teams were the best conditioned teams in. They were, they could run all day long. Oh, I, no. I was coaching guys that were three hundred pounds. They ran like cross country guys. Hmm. They were, yeah. You know, it was conditioning and what what is that Vince Lombardi saying? Uh, fatigue, fatigue makes cowards power. of us all. Well, they, they weren't no. They there might have been a few cowards, but they weren't fatigued. Yeah, <laughs> they, they were, and they weren't on the team long if they was playing for him. Yeah, well, they, they they didn't make it. They were. I, the, t- the things that those guys we we practiced two hours, double sessions, and at the end of that they'd have to run, you know, twelve one tens, and they'd have to make them. And if they didn't, they they kept running. Man, <laughs> yeah, it was it, you know they they made them too. I mean, it was just like, you know, they they, they lived know, up to the expectation, the standard. If not, they was gonna keep doing it. They were they were empowered to do it. You know they. You can do this. I think. I think that's a big part of it. Like, uh, I had this kid uh, at Penn State. Uh, he's, I think he's still in the pros. Jesse James. He was a freshman, true freshman tight end playing in front of a hundred thousand people. And I said, Jesse, I said, How? I said, Are you going to play in front of these people? Right? Yeah. You a little nervous? Yeah, maybe. I said, uh, how many times? How many times did we run this pattern and you caught this football? Oh, quite a few, coach. So you think you could do it again? Yeah. You think you could do it in front of a hundred thousand people? Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't, because it was it was just you were. It was expected, but you were also told that you could do it. It was. There's no doubt. You might get beat, but you you're going to do this and it's going to be, it's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. We were, we were playing, uh, I was at, at Ball State, we were playing Buffalo um, and they had the, who's the, who's the great defensive end from Buffalo, the University of Buffalo. Mack, Khalil Mack. So Khalil Mack is just, he's a sophomore and he's out there just killing us. We got a two minute drill and we got to go get this guy and shut him down because we're going to win with a field goal. And we, Pete Limbo was the head coach, and Bill O'Brien was the same way. We turned two minute drill into like the focus of everything. I mean, the way we handled situations was incredible, and two minute drill was the epitome. I think I think at Penn State we did it four days a week, and at Ball State and Elon we did it three days a week. But those kids knew that they were going to win that game, even though it was Khalil Mack, because they had done it so many times and they were empowered to it. They knew it was going to happen. They knew if they got in field goal range, we were going to kick a winning field goal. And we did. We beat them. That, of course, that guy teed up and lit our quarterback up, but he was getting the ball out. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I've been around a lot of good, good dudes and uh, heard a lot of, a lot of good good stuff over the years, and I'm I'm just happy. And this bald coach K keeps saying, "Who's your favorite offensive line?" Yeah, coach? he. I, I can take it down, coach. He's not asking. He he said this. He said, "Coach's verbiage is fire. His analogies are the science of O line technique." There you go. How about that? I'm a he science. loves it, coach. Yeah, I I, uh, I that's that's one of that's one of the things that gets me pissed off. Like people tell me that I'm. Uh, I'm I'm a scientist. I'm a I was an English major and a bad one. <laughs> I don't know anything about science. I just most of my science I learned on YouTube. You know? Yeah, Coach McNally told me you were an engineer. Uh, he says stuff. I I I'm good with tools. I understand tools. I understand levers. I'll tell you that. I understand yeah. levers. You know, there's there's three types of mechanical levers, and, and I understand those. I'm breaking this chair. Um, <laughs> Still heavy, uh, but but that's you know I think I think that when you uh, when you're talking about this stuff, every every player on the field is using the exact same uh, fundamentals. I don't care what position they're playing. 
the quarterback has, has got a unique skill set in throwing. But even the quarterback, quarterbacks don't they don't throw they don't throw like this. They accelerate the ball with a short arm, and as that as that ball accelerates and gains momentum, the arm lengthens and then follows through. The shot putter does the same thing. He starts with a short arm. He engages. And people say they're doing it with their hips. I'm saying they're they're engaging the ground, and I think their their core, not just their hips. They're torquing. They're torquing. And we got into this um, synchronized diagonal antagonist thing, where we said that. Well, it's a, if you're uh, coach, a, I don't even know what that means. What does that mean? Well, it just means this: you got you got agonists, agonists, and antagonists. Okay, and yeah. Agonists and antagonists. Yes. And if you have diagonal antagonists, let's say the front of your body on this side, the right side, and the back of your body on the left side. And if you synchronize those things, okay, if you let this right side pull you forward and this left side pull you backwards, and your shoulders, you use your shoulders and your hips as class two levers, you can generate a lot of force as long as your feet don't slip. And the more condensed you are, the shorter those levers are and the faster you can accelerate them. And the more the, they won't go as far, but they'll move more weight. OK, levers, levers, you exchange length, you exchange length for strength. OK, if you want if you want length, OK, you lose strength. If you want strength, you lose length. It's just the way it is. And. Uh, Sync by by taking a few of these little physics things and, uh, and these engineering things and adding them to your thoughts, you save a lot of time. Like there's three three types of levers. Okay, there's a class one, class two, and class three. And I'm, I'm probably going to screw it up. But a class a class one, you know, uh, the, you, you got a seesaw. Yeah. You got a, a hammer. And you got a, a a fishing pole, okay? You think of what a fishing pole is? It's got a fulcrum and a long pole. It, it's got long reach, but it, it doesn't have a strength, okay? That that lever, that hammer, it's, it, that head of that hammer doesn't move very far, but boy, it'll pull a nail right out of the board. And a seesaw is just balanced. You know, you take a seesaw and you either move the the, the input and output levers. Because you got a fat chick on one side, you got to get her closer to the fulcrum. Yeah, you can get it upside up. Well, that that right there, there's that's your shoulder girdle and your and your hips. Okay, there's the and and the fulcrum is your is your backbone. So you get that you get that pull and push at the same time. Okay, when you're going forward, I got a, I got a picture of Rocky Marciano, and he is like pulling back and stroking with that. That arm, and man, you could just see it. You could see what he's gonna when he lands that punch. It's gonna, it's gonna wreck somebody. <laughs> you look at uh, at uh, Tyson. Yeah, the peekaboo. He, he well, I mean, he's oh, he's doing this. He's yeah. oh, he's not doing this. Yeah, he's, doing, <laughs> he's locking that thing up. And we call that. Um, let me see if I can uh, if I can remember all these terms because I'm, I'm drawing blanks here. But when you lock the agonist and the antagonist against each other, that locks the joint. Okay, I have a, I have a technical term for that. But if, I, if I'm strong enough to do this, I do it. If I can't, I lock that up and I use this. Mm -hmm. That's not good enough. I lock that up and I use this. Yes. But locking that up allow, allows me to transfer the force from my hips to my hands. And and um, that that's where that load thing comes in. If I'm blocking a deep B, I might be able to just jab him. If I'm blocking a linebacker, maybe I can hook him up. I can get him off the ground with my hooks. If I'm blocking a, a you know a three technique that weighs 350 pounds, I better add some force. You know, and it's, and the force has got to be strong enough to overcome his load. That's that's basically it. There's not much else to it. Yeah, I think Coach McNally, I think you went over thoroughly what he wanted to hear about, Coach. <laughs> is, is there anything else, Coach, that we left out 
that you would like to say to the guys that are watching or going to watch, um, young offensive line coaches? I, I Everything, I, everything I, I've said today, if, if you go on my YouTube thing and you look, you'll find something about it in there. There's, like I said, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff. I, I don't know. The most important, the most important things I think are teaching the concept of leverage, leverage being advantage. Okay. And advantage determines technique. Toughness. Toughness is the ability to perform no matter how you feel. Okay, and the fundament, the three fundamentals: protect your own chest by uncoupling your hands, condense your body, make your make your lever short so that you can accelerate. Acceleration is the key to sport. Not not. Don't tell me about speed. Tell me about can he change? Can he change speed? Can he stop, start, or turn? How good can he do that? Well, the, the more condensed you are the easier you can do that. And yes. then, you know, make sure that you're, you're, you got contact with the ground. Don't, don't take these great big steps. Don't have, if your foot's in the air, you're not, you're not contacting the ground. You can't change. You can't accelerate. You can't do it. Now, once you're a runner, like he, he comes out of the blocks and he's built up momentum. Yeah. He's, he's basically striking the ground, but you, you know, here's, here's something. Do you realize that, I didn't realize this. I read it a couple of years ago. A full speed runner like Usain Bolt, one of those guys, he's putting five times the force into the into the ground to fight gravity as he is propelling himself forward. Five times the force. So gravity can be your friend. Don't let it work against you. And never, ever say you're stepping backwards. <laughs> How did you learn that, coach? How did I did learn? You say, did you say that at one time? I I just heard I heard guys talking about it, and you know, uh, you're. I like I said when I really I mean, broke that... into, when I really broke into college offensive line play, for them, I did it for about a year, and then we went to the wishbone, so we were going forward, and I thought I thought all this backward stuff was crazy. Then when I had the pass block. I, I scratch my head and I say, well, why is this, why are these guys getting, you know, getting stalemated all over the place? We can't move anybody. And it's sort of like, you know, you're, you're getting into a, a clinch with somebody who's the same as you. And maybe you're moving them a little bit, but like I said, a zero sum, nobody wins. Nobody wins. You know, you, you, you're, uh, you gotta, you gotta have, uh, somebody's gotta win. He, I gotta win and you gotta lose. That's the way it is. Well, how do we win when we're when we're opposing a force that's the same as ours? Add another force. Add a different force. That's so. You know, did I hear somebody? I heard enough people that you know. I heard enough people, and I remember Jim uh, in the. I think it was like 1980. He came out with the drop step and all that other stuff. <laughs> people would talk about it, and I was just like, man, that's that's. And then I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, that's just what Goody told us back in, you know, back in the day. Yeah. It, it it was, you know, well, three years later, I'm, I'm listening to one of the – I listened to one of the best line coaches in the country say drop step, and then I listened to one of the best defensive coordinators in the country say drop step. And I'm like, maybe we should look at this. <laughs> hmm. So we did. <laughs> Well, Coach, I appreciate you. We've been going over two hours, Coach. Have, well, have you ever done a two-hour uh, podcast? I guess that I'm, I like hearing myself talk, and I, I don't know if I I, th I think I did one other podcast, so I don't know. Was it two hours? I, I don't know. So far back, I, I can't remember. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to go look it up, Coach. I'm, yeah, well, competitive. I don't I'm competitive. I don't even know where it is. Yeah, I'll try, I'll try to find it. But Coach McNally will be on Tuesday from 8 to 10. So I want you to be um, ready to ask some questions, Coach. All right. How do I how do I get there? Oh, it'll be on YouTube, Coach. Okay. YouTube. I'll send you a link. Okay. Um, and it'll be on 
uh, a youtube.com forward slash totem pole sports. This, uh, yeah. This clinic is on the Totem Pole Nation, uh, Totem Pole Nation now, Totem Pole Nation channel. But okay. the Championship Football Coaches Clinic is sponsored by Rat Coach. Coach, thank you. I'm going to end this. We'll stay on and talk for a little bit. But I know all the coaches. I appreciate you coming on, Coach. Well, I hope I hope, uh, I hope I was a help. And I know I talk a lot, but, hey, that's what you wanted. You wanted somebody to talk. So, yes, right? sir. I wanted you to talk. Okay. Thank you, Coach. All right. Thank you.